Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on the mystical path of Rumi. And we are welcoming Sahel Shakari today. Sahel, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we will jump in in just a few moments, but I just wanted to uh, let you guys know a little bit about CIHS. If you're new to CIHS, we are the California Institute for Human Science. We are a, a graduate university as well as a research uh, institution. And uh, we offer academic degrees in psychology, integral health, and integral noetic sciences. And I'm sure to, that you'll find that um, the topic of Rumi uh, kind of interweaves with a lot of our topics of study at CIHS as well. Uh, my name is Nicole Ryle, and I'm the Director of Development and Public Programs here at CIHS. And CIHS Enlighten is uh, sponsoring today's webinar, and uh, the Enlighten portion of our institution is the public programming. So we are excited to offer pro public programs like the one that we are going to discuss today, um, certification programs, continuing education, and also uh, public enrichment programs. So um, we're really excited to bring you Sahil today. Um, so Hill is a, a professor and a Harvard trained healer, author, mystic, filmmaker and business consultant. His first book entitled How Did We Get Here is about the spiritual and philosophical roots of the crisis of the dying patriarchal, excuse me, global civilization published by Universal Publishers. He has been immersed in the mystical teachings of Rumi both existentially and intellectually since the dawn of the 21st century. Professor Shikari has written articles on mythology, religious movements, and the nature of education, and has taught courses in humanities, philosophy, and religion at both the college and university levels. His main interests lie in uncovering the essential spiritual truths lying behind our mainstream cultural narratives from a foundation of love and consciousness. And that's really right where our um, interplay of CIHS and so Hale intersect. So um, we're so excited to welcome him today. Um, he'll be able to fill you in on where you can find more work, uh, more of his work, his website and social media handles. Um, and uh, for today's course, uh, it's going to be kind of an overview of his upcoming course. Um, the upcoming course is the mystical path of Rumi. And it will take you, the student, on a journey of transformation and self-discovery through the soul and work of arguably the greatest mystic poet of divine love, Rumi. Through the guidance of an instructor immersed in the Persian Sufi mystic tradition of Rumi, you'll be able to deepen your consciousness and self-awareness by experiencing the richness and magical depth of the poetry of Rumi to uncover various states and stations of the spiritual path embedded in the universal wisdom and radiance of his teachings. Oh, I just think that description is so beautiful. <laughs> uh, and then just a little bit about the course. It's a 10 week course running from June 14th to August 16th on Wednesday evenings from five to seven Pacific Standard Time. All classes will be recorded and sent out the following morning. So if you're not able to attend uh, one or all of the live sessions, you'll, you're able to take it at your convenience. Also, the California Institute of Human Science will award uh, certificates of completion at the end of the course. And then special for today, so happy to have you all here. We're offering uh, everyone who's registered for today's informational webinar a $50 discount. Um, the course is listed for you at $399 until tomorrow, and then the price will increase to $450. So I'll give you some links later on, um, direct links to the registration page, so you can take advantage of that today if you're interested in joining us. <clears throat> and then just for today's agenda, in a few moments, we will welcome Sahail for an informational presentation uh, about his own journey with Sufism, mysticism, and Rumi, as well as information on the specifics of the upcoming course. We will have time for Q&A after his presentation, so just be sure to jot down any questions for you that may arise during uh, his presentation. And then lastly, um, if you are up for it in the audience, we would love to get to know you better. Um, so you can use the chat box to take a moment to pop your name, where you're from, and maybe what brought you to today's webinar. Are you here for personal growth or professional development or a combination of the two? 
Uh, is the topic aligned with your line of work or education? Um, so yeah, we just like to kind of get to know the audience a little bit better in that way as well. So a recording of this presentation will also be available. We'll try to send it out tomorrow morning as well. And I think I covered all of the basics or um, the nitty gritty details. And now we can turn it over to Sahil for his introduction. Thank you so much for being here, Sahil. Thank you so much, Nicole. I really appreciate your help and gracious introduction. Greetings and blessings, everyone. It is an honor to be with you. Thank you so much for, for being here uh, to discuss and learn more about uh, this class about the mystical path of Rumi. And uh, it is an honor to be able to share with you. So with that, I'll uh, jump right into my presentation here. I'll share my screen and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, all right, can you all see the uh, presentation? Okay, great. All right. So... Okay, so uh, what we're gonna be covering today is um, some background about Molana Rumi. Um, and then we're gonna spend the most time talking about that and then we'll spend some time talking about my own personal journey with Rumi. Uh, and then we'll discuss the benefits of studying about Rumi. Uh, and then following that, we will have a Rumi recitation uh, with Ms. Mojde Habibi. Uh, and then after that, we'll have a little introspection and then we'll open it up for discussion. Okay, all right, so background about Rumi. So his name, his name is Molana Jalaluddin Muhammad Balhi al Rumi. Okay, so he has many names, and many of these are titles. Okay, so um, his given name, Jalaluddin Muhammad. Okay, so Jalaluddin means the glory of the path. So that's the literal meaning of of uh, his name, Jalaluddin. Muhammad obviously is the, is the prophet uh, from the Islamic tradition. Balhi um, relates to where he was born. So um, he's, he was born in the city of Bath in what is modern day um, Afghanistan or Afghanistan. And Al-Rumi, so Rumi is the title that was given to him when he and his family had emigrated from uh, the larger Khorasan region uh, of which Baal was a part of in, Afghan in Afghanistan um, to flee from the Mughals who were invading and they had uh, migrated to what is modern day Turkey. And, um, and so in modern day Turkey, that was part of the Eastern Roman Empire and so after the time of his migration, which is from the time he was about 24 um, until he passed away at around age um, 66. So he was uh, living there. And so he had gained the title, uh, the Roman, if you will. So Rumi literally means the Roman, um, but that was a title that was given after his family had migrated um, to the Eastern Roman Empire, modern day Turkey, uh, the city of Konya. And Molana means our master, okay? So that's the, the honorific, um, respectful title that his uh, students and disciples would call him. All right, a little about his family life, okay? So, so Molana Rumi, he grew up in a family that was very um, learned, very knowledgeable, 
and, and also spiritual, okay? And so uh, they were also a, um, they were, you know, a devout um, Muslim family uh, from the greater Persian empire in, like I said, Khorasan. Um, and um, his father was a, it was a very uh, well-known and renowned um, spiritual Muslim theologian. I think that's the best way to put it. And so, you know, he was immersed in that tradition from childhood. He had learned closely, you know, from his father, Bahauddin Alad, and um, was, you know, considered a, um, one of the most learned people in the region, you know, from the time that he was young. And, you know, he had a wife, he had four children, and, um, you know, his parents were, were married as long as, you know, they were alive together. And, yeah, so that's a little about his background. And then he had, he had also, you know, developed into a prominent scholar in his own right. So he was, he was a prominent, I want to say, spiritual Muslim scholar. Okay, so from the time where, um, you know, he was raised by his father and you know, his mother, and he, he had started uh, doing some teaching uh, in the subjects of theology, jurisprudence, philosophy. Um, so these were areas where he was very learned in. And when his father passed away, when, when he was age 24, his father, so after they had emigrated to Konya in Turkey, uh, his father was teaching at prominent uh, seminaries, prominent Islamic uh, seminaries of the time. And, um, and then Rumi had continued in that trajectory. So he had took over after his father's passing, teaching the same type of materials. Okay, so, uh, so I mentioned that he was a respected spiritual um, theologian. So was his father and, and Rumi as well. And, you know, he had many, many students who had developed a deep respect for him and his knowledge. Okay, and so this is from the time that he was, you know, I want to say around 18 or so, all the way until age 37. Okay, so from 18 to 24, you know, he had developed a, um, a following while his father was still the, you know, the respected authority. Um, but then after his father passed away, he took over the, the helm, if you will, and was continuing in his father's um, trajectory as a well-respected spiritual uh, Muslim theologian. Okay. And then, as I had mentioned, he had many students who had, you know, developed a following for him. And, you know, he became married and um, he had children, you know, his, his oldest son, Sultan of Alad, was a uh, very close to him um, as far as his uh, latter perspective that had developed, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and, you know, he was very, you know, renowned in the community. So this picture you see here in the slide uh, this is showing Rumi's influence here amongst uh, different students and disciples. Okay. Then at the age of 37, uh, Rumi had met a mystic by the name of 
Shams of Tabriz or Shams of Tabrizi. Okay, so Rumi was already very well known, as I had mentioned, and was you know very respected in academic, intellectual, and spiritual circles. Okay, so um, when I say spiritual, I'm talking about um, you know like the the more spiritual aspect of the Islamic tradition. Um, you know, like for example, in you know Christianity, you know we have you know, theologians who are uh, more of a spiritual bent, um, you know, kind of, you want to say a bit more inclusive than some of the other more, um, you know, uh, rigid adherence or exclusive adherence. And so Rumi was in a similar, um, you know, he was in a, he grew up with a similar worldview, a, a spiritual Muslim family that was very well respected uh, academically and religiously. And then when Shams of Tabriz came, uh, Rumi had noticed something very profound about Shams. So he was a mystic who had something in his being that, that deeply transformed Rumi that was very attractive to Rumi. There was something in his being that essentially lit him on fire. Shams was, uh, was there's very little known about Shams's personal background. Um, it was, it's known though that he was a, a mystic, someone who was very in tune with the more esoteric aspects of philosophy, uh, religion, and uh, and the search for for truth. And when Rumi encountered this in Shams, he realized that Shams had something that other people that he had encountered before did not have. There was something about his being, there was something about his presence, there was something about his words, about his energy that captivated and, um, and fully intoxicated Rumi. And when I say intoxicated, I mean with a, with a divine presence that fully was immersed into, into his being through Shams. And so when this happened, when this encounter happened, Rumi's disciples and students at the time, because I had mentioned he was a, a prominent scholar and respected theologian, spiritual theologian as well. Um, you know, his students saw that, you know, Rumi was, spending so much time with Shams. Um, there was something about Shams that led Rumi to feel deeply that mysteries of the universe are being uncovered within the presence of Shams and that Rumi was then um, discovering these within himself through his encounter with Shams. And so he spent a significant amount of time with him. And, um, and so there was so much less time than being devoted to his students, his studies, his family, his disciples, his students, his career. And so this image that I have here, it, it, it really shows, I feel, uh, the type of relationship that Rumi and Shams had. Um, there was a deep, profound recognition of uh, the divine mysteries that Shams was able to impart to, to Rumi.
So, and we'll go into this more in, in the class um, as far as the relationship between um, Rumi and Shams and uh, some of the meaning behind it and some of the, um, the way that Rumi expressed this love for Shams. Um, and so as a result of that amazing encounter and relationship with Shams, so much inspiration outpoured from Rumi. So Rumi went from, if I want to couch it in Western terms, so he went from being a prominent spiritual uh, theologian who was very well respected to becoming the Shakespeare of the Eastern world. Um, you know, his, uh, what emanated from his being as a result of the encounter with Shams is nothing short of, of a miracle and, um, and an ocean of love and wisdom. And this is best um, captured in his two major works the Masnavi and the Divan of Shams. And the Masnavi, um, which you'll often find written as the Mathnawi, which is really just, it's more of an, it's an Arabic recitation of the word Masnavi. Um, but Rumi was Persian speaking, he was Persian background. And so the way that he pronounced it was Masnavi. Um, and so Masnavi means rhymed couplet. Okay, and so it's a, it's a way of expressing poetry in, in the Persian language, essentially where the last word um, of, the, of the line of the verse rhymes with um, the second half of the couplet. Okay, so the two last words rhyme. So that's the idea of a masnavi. And it is extremely common in Persian literature is most, you know, um, renowned poets uh, from the Persian tradition, you know, up until the modern era, you know, they expressed their poetry primarily in the form of the Masnavi, which is, you know, the rhymed couplet. But because Rumi's work was so full of depth, full of beauty, full of love and full of wisdom, um, it became known as the Masnavi. And it was six composed in six different books or six, um, uh, six books, I think is the best way to put it. Uh, they all comprise the Masnavi. And uh, they were written over the last 10 years of his life. The Divan of Shams uh, was given the name of so Divan means collection, and Shams is, you know, the, the name of his, uh, I like to call him his uh, guru teacher, you know, his inspiration, you know, his, his love with, you know, his divine love, um, you know, who really exposed him to the, to the universal mysteries. So he gave the name of Shams to his collection of ecstatic love poetry. Okay, so divan means collection. So the divan of Shams, because it was infused and inspired by the presence of Shams, he called it the divan of Shams, um, but it was recited by, uh, by Molana Rumi. All right. Okay, and so I had mentioned that Rumi came from a spiritual Muslim family and tradition. Uh, and so they, his father was a, uh, a teacher of Sufism, a, a respected teacher in the seminaries of Sufism. Um, and the tradition that you know, Rumi became so renowned and known for is, is Sufism. 
And so I want to give a little bit of background about Sufism. Now, you know, typically when we hear the word Sufism, we typically associate that with um, the esoteric aspect or the inner aspect of Islam, the Islamic religion, and, and also with, you know, the whirling dervishes of the Mevlevi or the Molevi uh, Sufi order, okay, which was inspired directly by uh, Molana Rumi. Okay, um, but Sufism as a whole is, it's, what it really is, is a tradition uh, to tap into the mysteries of the universe. And it's really what has, you know, existed prior to the Islamic tradition as well. So this is not um, something that is specific to the, you know, the Islamic tradition. Yes, it, it did flourish during the Islamic period. However, it predates the Islamic tradition. So basically, you know, from this vantage point, the Essenes of, Christ, of the Christian tradition were considered by Sufis in the Islamic tradition to be Sufis in their own right, even though they may not have ascribed that name to themselves. Okay, so I just want to give you a little perspective on that. And then with, with Shams, Shams took Rumi so much deeper into these mysteries of Sufism than he had experienced before. Uh, because you know, he was exposed to the tradition. As I mentioned, his father was a you know, prominent you know, Sufi Muslim scholar, um, but Shams took him experientially to, to a level that was uncharted territory. All right, and so I have this picture here to show that really, you know, Sufism is it's the longing for truth in whatever form it may show up as. It's not relegated to a specific tradition. It's not, um, you know, relegated to you know the um, you know the Islamic rites and rituals. You know, although as I mentioned, it did flourish, you know, in that period, uh, there was a period of around um, approximately the ninth century till around um, the 16th century, where uh, these esoteric schools, these mystery schools, because essentially that's what um, the Sufi schools were. They were, mis there were schools to uncover the mysteries of the universe. So they were tolerated um, more so than they were in the Christian tradition under the church, okay? So, um, so Sufism was, even though they were still, the Sufis were still outcasts in the society at large, they were less of outcasts than they were in the um, in the Christian tradition, um, you know, going back to you know the, the Dark Ages, the medieval period, and the early development of Christianity. Okay, so I just wanted to give that um, context around Sufism as well. All right, now a little background about myself. So. I come from an Iranian American family. Uh, well, I should say I am an Iranian American. So my family, my parents are Iranian. They immigrated to the US from Iran in the 70s prior to the revolution in Iran. Um, I was born in New Jersey, grew up in Southern California. And Rumi was a part of my culture growing up. Okay, so so Rumi is deeply loved um, and respected in the Persian-speaking world. So 
you know, Iran, Afghanistan, um, Uzbekistan, you know, other Persian speaking areas deeply um, respect Rumi. And so, and, and so when I say they deeply loved him, it's, there's, a, there's a general reverence for, for Rumi in society. In fact, many, many people have, you know, memorized many, many lines of his poetry in the Persian speaking world. And so I remember like taking trips to Iran with uh, my parents growing up. And, you know, you would just hear relatives be reciting, you know, poems of Rumi just in different life situations and just reciting a verse of Rumi. It's like, oh, this is just like what Rumi says here and, and just relating it to their everyday lives. I know that it was, you know, for, um, you know, growing up, you know, people were, you know, in school, they would, you know, memorize some of the verses of Rumi and, um, and other prominent mystics of the time as well. Um, so, so there was a, so Rumi was a part of pop culture. So let's put it, I think that's a good way of putting it. Now, that's not to say that, you know, people in, you know, in the Persian speaking world, you know, necessarily have, um, you know, connected deeply with, with, you know, some of the, the deeper elements, um, teachings of Rumi, but he's, you know, there is a, you know, popular reverence for his teachings. Like whenever anyone would mention him, you know, there's a respect, there's a respect, you know, he's very well, you know, loved and respected. And for me, that's really how I fell in love with his teachings. Um, so growing up, when I was here, people recite his poetry, there was just this warmth that I feel. I could kind of understand the meaning, but kind of not. But I, but I could get a feel for his energy when I would hear people recite his poetry. And I would just feel like, oh my God, who is this loving soul that they're reciting from? And so I just really felt a connection with him from the time that I was young. Um, and then, you know, later, you know, when I was in high school, um, you know, I got more exposed to, uh, you know, different programs in uh, Persian culture that my dad would take me to. And, um, and I could feel the love even deeper then. Uh, and then once I, you know, started the university, I was taking a, a, just a, a class about, and this is not at the university, but, you know, a, a, a cultural enrichment class to learn more about, uh, you know, Rumi's teachings and other mystics you know, from, uh, from the Middle East, and Rumi was heavily featured. And so I remember taking that class and just feeling so inspired by, you know, his words and his teachings um, that, you know, I asked the teacher, I said, you know, if we want to go and study these teachings more, like, how can we do that? Like, how, how can I immerse myself in these teachings more? And, um, and this is, you know, here in Orange County at the time. And he said, well, if you really want to immerse yourself in these teachings, there's a, a prominent scholar of Rumi, you know, one of the most um, prominent in the world who's at Harvard currently. And so if you're able to go and study with him, that would be an excellent way to immerse yourself. And so, you know, by the grace of God, um, I was, you know, I had pursued that path and I was able to do so. And so um, it was a true blessing to be able to immerse myself, you know, more deeply in the teachings of Rumi, um, you know, uh, under the, the guidance of, you know, one of the most prominent uh, Rumi scholars you know, in the world. And so from there, you know, then I became more interested in the esoteric aspects of Rumi's teachings um, because I was primarily studying him intellectually um, while I could still feel the heart resonance deeply. Um, my classes were more about, you know, learning. Um, and then I pursued the teachings of Rumi at a more uh, existential level uh, in a more heart-centered way. 
And, uh, and then I was, you know, graced by a Sufi tradition that really helped me to deeply connect with the words and teachings of Rumi in, uh, in an experiential way. In fact, I would just remember, you know, throughout the years, um, you know, being in the community that, you know, I was able to really appreciate what Rumi was saying at a deeper level, you know, having been um, exposed and immersed in, uh, you know, the Sufi tradition. So, um, so that's a little bit about my experience with with Rumi, and and then this this uh, journey of connection has continued since then. You know, there was there was another um, uh, prominent scholar of Rumi that I had studied with prior to the Sufi immersion, um, and then uh, there were other uh, spiritual teachers who helped me connect more deeply, you know, with his work uh, later on as well. So. So yeah, so that's a little bit about my experience with Rumi. And, and it's continuing to unfold. So, uh, you know, Rumi is an ocean. And so it's, you know, as I'm here with you all today, I know that, you know, his, his presence and his guidance is, and his blessing, you know, is here with us, uh, you know, as we uncover and discover, um, you know, his teachings in a deeper way. Okay, so why study Rumi? Okay, so Rumi is, you know, as I've mentioned, you know, his his teachings are very they're very powerful. They are very deep. They're very existential, very mystical, and through his teachings you know, we are able to better understand ourselves. We are able to deeply connect with ourselves. And through this deeper connection with ourselves, we're able to more deeply connect with, with humanity and with the universe. Um, and in addition to that, you know, we are also able to help um, in some cases, as is illustrated by the cover of this book here, um, we are able to help to really transform and transmute, uh, in some cases, uh, some psychological ailments. Okay, so the author of this book here, The Rumi Prescription, um, is Melody Moezi. Um, she uh, had mentioned that she grew up in a family where you know Rumi was very well loved and revered you know by by her father and um, you know she was a successful lawyer and she had already published a book as well um, and then she had discovered that she had bipolar disorder and she had mentioned that through her deeper engagement with the poetry of Rumi, that she was able to really thrive and integrate the, um, the disorder that she was diagnosed with. And so Rumi helped her to, you know, continue to, to shine and um, thrive you know, irrespective of whatever, you know, diagnosis that, um, that she was given. And I should also mention that, uh, you know, she and her father had, you know, compiled some beautiful poetic translations uh, of some of the verses of Rumi, which I feel are really, um, you know, heartfelt and poetic. And uh, so I feel like they did a great job there. Okay, all right. And then another aspect of why study Rumi is 
is the nourishment of the soul. Okay, and so part of what helped me realize that Rumi was so nourishing was being exposed to the original verse of Rumi. Okay, so in the class, in the 10 week class, uh, we're gonna be, so I have some suggested readings for you all, which I highly recommend um, uh, that we will go through together and we'll be discussing, you know, in our class sessions together. Okay, so you will all be assigned certain readings to go through. And then in our class sessions, we will dive deeper into the themes of those readings, into the background of Rumi, his perspective, his experience of Shams, and really um, work to dive into the deeper meanings of his stories, his fables, um, and his, his gems of wisdom. And a part of recognizing the, the depth of love in Rumi was my exposure to the original Persian um, of which you know, Rumi spoke and recited his poetry. In. And so I feel that it is really you know, helpful for us to get a taste of that um, together, both today and during class. And so um, we are very honored today to have with us Ms. Mojde Habibi, who is a world-renowned reciter of poetry, um, a leading uh, news anchor and TV personality in the Persian-speaking world. Uh, she has produced some of the most um, you know, inspiring programs in Persian language community, both on radio and television. Her program, Ashevane, which uh, is uh, loosely translated as lovingly, is very well uh, loved and respected amongst the Persian speaking community um, all around the world. And so we're blessed to have her here with us today to recite some of the verses of Rumi's poetry in the original Persian language so that we can all uh, get a sense and taste uh, of his original words. And so um, with that, I will uh, ask for Ms. Mojdan Habibi to uh, join us here and recite some of Rumi's poetry. And then I will come back and we will continue with the presentation. Let's get the, the audio up here. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Shakeri. Greetings to all. It is an honor to be here with you all, and uh, I will be reciting some lines from the beginning of the first book of the Masnaviya, Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi. بشنو این می چون حکایت می کند از جدایی ها شکایت می کند 
که از نیستان تا مرا ببریده اند در نفیل من مرد و زن نادیده اند سینه خواهم شرح شرحی در فران تا بگویم شرح درد اشتیار هر کسی که دور ماند از اصل خیش باز جوید روزگار بسته من به هر جمعیتی نالا شدم جفت بدحالان و خوشحالان شدم کسی از زن خود شد یارم و از درون من نجوز اسرام سر من از ناله من دور نیست دیگ کشم و گوش را آنون نیست هنز جان و جان زتن مستون نیست دیگ کس را دیگ جان دستون نیست آتش است این بانگ نایو نیست باد آتش است این بانگ نایو نیست باد که این آتش ندارد نیست باد محرم این هوش جز بیهش نیست مرزبان را مشتری جز گوش نیست در نیابد حال پخته هیچ خام پس سخن کوتاه باید و سلام Oh, great. Thank you so much, Ms. Habibi. It was lovely and very inspiring. Thank you. Wonderful. So continuing on with our discussion. Of why study room. Okay, so what you see here on the screen are uh, disciples of the Mevlevi Sufi order, who were, as I mentioned earlier, directly inspired uh, by Rumi's teachings. And his two masterpieces, the Masnavi and the Divan of Shams, were heavily you know, inspired by this dance, this whirling dance of Rumi, which became uh, central to a specific Sufi tradition. And this dance is called the Sama, this, the whirling dervish dance. Um, and it was through this experience, this divine experience of joy, love, and ecstasy from which the, the divine genius that emanated through his works was able to arise. Okay. And so 
Rumi helps us to connect deeper to our own selves. Um, so from my own experience, I can you know, say that wholeheartedly. And um, to help us understand and really understand, if you will, to really feel and taste the wisdom of the universe. And, and this helps us in so many ways. It helps us in our, uh, number one, in our relationship with ourselves. Uh, number two, our relationship with, with other people. So professional, strangers, uh, community at large, um, also in our relationships our primary romantic relationships and uh, to the universe. So Rumi's teachings, uh, they really help to connect to the, to our heart, our soul and beyond. All right, and um, now I just want to take a minute or two to have some time for a little introspection, okay? So I'd like for us to get a little piece of paper um, or write on your computer. Just take a little notebook or um, take a, you know, a note on your computer if you don't have one handy. Um, and I wanna do an exercise where I'd like for us to write down what you want Rumi's depth of love and wisdom to teach you, okay? So write down what burning questions you have that you feel like Rumi can help you answer. And so, Connect with your higher self and feel free to call on Rumi himself if you feel so inclined. And really ask what your soul is longing to know where you feel Rumi can, can help you uncover and experience the answer. So let's just take a couple minutes to go ahead and, and write this down.
Okay. All right. Well, thank you so, so much, everyone, for being here with me. Uh, I really appreciate your kind, loving attention. And uh, I look forward to seeing some of you in the class that begins in two weeks. And Nicole, thank you so much. I'll pass it back to you. Yes, thank you so much. That was uh, such a nice taste of what's to come. And uh, I just think that you speak such uh, uh, so authentically, right? Such so from the heart that you said that Rumi has been a part of your life since you can remember. And uh, I love how you reference the nourishment of the soul. And uh, especially in this day and age, we all need a bit of that, I think. So it will be a beautiful dive into the nourishment of the soul facilitated by you that um, your, your experience, both in uh, uh, your schooling, your academia, as well as life experience with Rumi just really is inspiring. And um, I think the course is going to be really a nice transformational journey for all those that attend. So thank you so much. And um, thank you to Miss Habibi. That was a beautiful rendition of uh, some of the um, traditional uh translations of Rumi. So I really appreciated that as well. Um, for anybody in our audience, if you have any questions, you can type them into the Q&A box or um, you can, um, thank you, Pam. Um, you can also um, raise your hand with the, with the raise hand functions and you can speak your question uh, to Sohail if you would like. Um, let's see. Um, Pam is asking, will there be any books required for the class? Yeah, so I will have one book that I would uh, require, and then I will have other suggested readings as well. Um, so, so yes, um, we'll be working, you know, with one of the, uh, the best translations of, you know, Rumi's parables as well, um, and we'll really dive into that. And then, you know, we will make sure that we dive into some of the, the mysteries of the stories um, in class. And so there'll be one required reading, and then I'll have other suggested readings available in the course outline uh, that we'll provide, um, you know, to those who register as well. Yes, great, thank you. Well, and like we said, um, registration is open now and it will continue um, until the course begins. The course begins uh, two weeks from today on June 14th. It is an evening course from 5 to 7 p.m., but all sessions will be recorded and sent out immediately after. Um, so if you would like to take advantage of uh, being here for our informational session, we'd love to offer you that $50 off. I just popped a link in the chat box uh, directly to the registration site. You're also feel free to email me. Um, I will put um, the email in the chat. You can also visit cihs.edu and click on CIHS Enlighten, and I'll, I'll link to that as well for any additional information that you might uh, need for the course but oh and then um so how where can they find you i i your do you want to let them know your website and their in your media handles sure yeah so you can find more information about me on my website www.sacredpowermedicine.com and then you can also find me on social media under the handle star of sohail um, so um, the name Sohail is a star. It's, it was considered as like, the farthest star from the universe. And so, um, so thus the, the handle star of Sohail. And so you can find me under that handle in Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, uh, as well as Telegram. Great. Yeah, I was just going to copy your email address and pop it in the chat box as well. I'm sorry, your, your website. <clears throat> okay. 
All right. Well, like I said, um, this recording will also be available. I'm going to send it out this afternoon to everybody who registered for today's free informational session. And we look forward to you to seeing you all in a few weeks when the course begins. So thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom with us, Sahil. We look forward to more of it to come. All right. And thank you all for being here. If you're new to our community, welcome. We are so happy that you're here and we hope to see you again soon. All right. Have so a great much, day, everybody. Thank you. Thank, so much, everybody. thank you. Have a great afternoon. Mm.